Yeah. I Here we go. Buttons. Hopefully it says it's setting up my thing. Okay, it says it's live now. I think we're live. Okay. Good Hi, morning. Everybody. This is Elise Bui. Hey Marianne, thank you so Hi, much for joining me. Happy to. Today I have Marianne Nelson on my Facebook Live. I know y'all get sick of looking at me every time. So I decided we're going to start doing guests. And Marianne is probably one of my very favorite people I work with in my professional community. She's a financial neutral. Marianne, can you tell people what a financial neutral is? What do you do? What are the other things you do besides being a financial neutral? Sure. Um, there's a process when you get divorced where all of your paperwork and all of your checking accounts and savings accounts and loans and all that stuff have to be cataloged and written down and at some point in time distributed between the parties. If you're working in a non-collaborative divorce fashion, you likely will have two different people doing that, one for each of you. And it might even be the attorneys, so it can get pretty expensive. In collaborative, we just bring on one person and I'm neutral and I do the work for both people. And that is so helpful because you are an expert at the numbers and you can bring together all the documents that both parties need. Yeah. I know we use you in all kinds of contexts, not just collaborative. I mean, our firm, yeah. I'm a firm believer in using a financial person to do finances and you're going to do it at a more cost effective rate for the clients. So I will often, I know, send people to you early on just to get an idea. Sometimes people don't have a clue. Can they live in two homes and what's that gonna look like? So what do you do in yeah. those cases? Yeah, um, those cases come to me a couple of different ways. Sometimes they come to me with just one person coming to me and sometimes both people come to me. Um, I, I never function as a, um, I never really take sides in any matter to tell you the truth right. uh, because it, when you're, when you're just writing stuff down, it doesn't matter. Right. But sometimes I also work with people if they want to see what it might look like on a particular way to have assets divided. And I can do that, work with them on that, talk to them about it, let them know why, um, what they're thinking about may or may not be what they're going to end up with, or it may not be suiting their purpose. So sometimes it's just a lot about education. Yeah. And that's, that's really important. I would say the education is, I mean, the most critical piece. I know for me as an attorney, I'll do a consult. And as you know, I know you see this all the time. Somebody will be like, I must keep the marital home. And I'm like, well, have you crunched all the numbers? Do you understand what the cost of the home is? What? And they're like, well, no, but I'm keeping the home. Like that's where my children grew up. I must keep it. Yeah. Yeah. And I have to have those tough conversations yeah. minus the financial background about that might not be your wisest move to right. keep the marital home. We need to look at the data. Right. Do you have those conversations too? All the time. All the time. Um, you know, sometimes we even go so far as to have whoever wants to keep the home reach out to a, uh, a mortgage person. And we've got a couple people that we use in the industry and get a feel for how much income do you need in order to actually keep this home? Right. Um, rather than me just saying, oh, that's never gonna work. You know, I, I, I like to let somebody else be the buzzkill uh, on those. <laughs> <laughs> and I also actually talked to him about the realities of being able to refinance a house. There's not just the home keeping, there's also the other person wants to get off the mortgage. Right. And that can be, just as difficult of a conversation, frankly. Absolutely. Well, and I know I often have conversations around things like, you know, property taxes, um, the maintenance of the home. Oh, yeah. You know, do you really need this six bedroom home for you? Yeah. yeah. Just because your kids grew up yeah. in it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And that even boils down to, you really do need to sell that car that you've got an $800 monthly payment on. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you really do need to look at uh, $2,000 a month in food budget. So right. there's a lot of lifestyle conversation 
that has to occur that's separate from just the division of the assets when people start looking at how much it costs for the rest of the absolutely life. private school that's a big one yep oh that's huge yeah. well i know uh, for me one time when one thing we do when we send people to you we often are looking for you know having those conversations about what it's really going to cost in two homes like because people i think sometimes have the idea of course our homes should be equal yeah. and obviously that's ideal you know i i love to see when that can work out but sometimes there's just not assets for right. two equal homes and right. we might need to make adjustments while the children are still in the home maybe it needs to look one way and then maybe when the children leave we can kind of get to a place where it seems and feels more equitable yeah. to the people yeah and i think the trickiest part is when um the person who wants to keep the home is the person who's not currently employed outside of the home right that that becomes difficult I think that is, I mean, the, it's one of the most difficult conversations I yeah. have with people and, you know, obviously it's not always the case, but a lot of times it's that stay at home mom yeah. and you're trying to talk about, you know, I really like to focus on how are you going to be okay post-divorce? Right. Like instead of being house rich, let's be more house poor and cash rich, right. you know, so right. that you're going to not have the strength. <clears throat> trying to explain to somebody who hasn't worked in 20 years or who has been taking care of children that it can get really stressful when you need yeah. to go back to work and pay all these bills and that extra vacuuming of the house might not be worth it the um there's a a feeling i guess or a belief um a lot of times on the on the parts of those stay-at-home moms that their children won't do well if they right. leave that home um yeah that's a conversation i think that everybody in this profession has with them at probably all of our different ways of, of taking that in to um talk about <laughs> what's reality and what what you can and can't do based on what you believe the kids are going to feel like because you know frankly kids aren't happy with a divorce regardless and that's the least part of it that the house is not uh, going to provide them stability it's the parents it's the parents and i tell people all the time kids are totally jazzed about getting new rooms yep. and if you, you can get a new room spend a few hundred dollars at ikea decorate it it's going to go way farther than maintaining their current room at whatever the mortgage right. is for the next however many decades that you're planning to do this right when you could completely flip this i call it flipping that pancake and really look at this differently yeah because children need two parents who are not stressed and who yeah. are able to co-parent productively yeah. that's what makes kids thrive through divorce yes yeah. yep yeah. And if we could somehow get that message out to the entire universe, um, that would make yeah. me happy. I feel like I could die peacefully if people said <laughs> that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I haven't quite figured that one out either. <laughs> <laughs> either, but it's so important. And I yeah. think that having these conversations, and I love that somebody like you, who's a financial person, all your background is in finances, money, crunching numbers, managing people, all those things to then be able to have these conversations with parents. Because I think as an attorney, you know, we feel like we're having these conversations over and over again. I mean, I, I know I feel like I'm a broken record at times and you're circling back with a client, you know, talking about these things, yet having another professional from another viewpoint be able to have those same conversations, I think is so compelling. Good. I, I oftentimes the, wonder if the coach should be having more of them, but I, I think some of these conversations take everybody's perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I think if a person, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those believers that people, it takes them like six or seven times to hear the same message to yeah. kind of really start yeah. embracing it and internalizing it and i have had many a client tell me well marianne says the same things you do so i guess and i'm like hallelujah to marianne 
you know, but I think that in their mind, you know, I'm all this child related, I focus on children. So they think about that. But then when the numbers person can say some of those same things, I think it makes a real difference to parents. Good. I, I'm glad that that's the message that you're getting back. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I love that. I like your thought on it taking six or seven times for people to hear it. I was um, in a meeting yesterday with, with a couple and we were doing the work that we do. And we were at that point where we were really kind of really separating what the finances really were going to look like. Right. What's really coming in, what's really going out. How are you going to bridge that? How are you going to get there? And frankly, it was, um, it's not the first time we've had the conversation. We tried doing this many different ways, but I watched it when it finally landed right. on one person. And yep. honestly, I have to tell you, it was heartbreaking uh. because when there was the realization of this really is changing, this is really going to be very, very different. Right. Um, it, it was just so hard, but I'm so glad because I just would prefer people be prepared then totally. just go rushing on out there and thinking everything's going to be the same when it's not going to be the same. No, and I think the more we can give people solid reality and solid numbers and let them reality test yeah. with their lives and their budgets and their thoughts, yeah. we are serving them so much better than this whole ostrich routine of sticking your head in the sand and going on about your business. I mean, when I, when I see people who are kind of like, keep writing checks and keep paying things. Yeah. I mean, when I notice those and you'll, you know, we'll get emails from other attorneys like so-and-so overdrafted the account or so-and-so this happened, you know, I mean, I'll immediately call in my client and I'm like, whoa, we need a major reality check here because you, this is better for you to get this under control right now in this yeah. environment where you've got people to help you, you know, you've got a process in place and let's figure this out. Yeah. Because, I, I, yeah, I mean, the stress of that, you know, overdrawn checking accounts where, you know, the daycare is calling, I'm sorry, you haven't paid your daycare bill, so right. your child isn't welcome tomorrow. Right. You know, right. right. Like, those are all things that have to get figured out. I mean, one of the things I know when I got divorced, and it's a big struggle because most of us, let's face it, aren't great money managers. I mean, that is not everybody's forte. Right. People often live pretty paycheck to paycheck in a one family home. Yeah. So you want to put on a two family home. And I always tell people, I'm like, money doesn't get created by the divorce. I can assure <laughs> you. Like, yeah. And, and so it's like we to try to figure this out. And I mean, I think people have to start looking at things so holistically, like, all the things they do, yeah. you know, like whether you're going to Starbucks every day and dropping $8 on coffee every day might not have seemed like a huge deal, but I mean, that can add up, that can be yeah. soccer for your child or, you know, whatever. One of the conversations yesterday, um, the mom was talking about how it's really expensive to have your children's friends hang out at your house oh. because you're paying to feed them you're paying and I said you know I understand why you want to be the fun house I totally get why you want to be the house where the kids hang out um but maybe you got to go to you know pizza rolls rather than smoked salmon or some yeah. other way to manage that expense well you you know it's interesting you bring that up I mean this is not I mean as you know I'm the mom of six four biological two-step kids we had serious kids in our home. I, my boys are large, large humans, and they all had large human friends <laughs> who ate a lot. Yes. And so here comes, you know, the football team to my home and it's expensive. Well, oh, we yeah. started doing a thing where I would, we would work with the other moms and we would put in a pool. So we had an account for feeding these children. What a great and idea. So, we would all contribute a certain amount of money. I think we did it monthly at the time. And then we would just like, you know, go when we would go um, grocery shopping, let's say I had the boys all weekend, one weekend. So I'd go to Costco, buy whatever. I would submit that receipt 
to the other moms in the group. We'd just see it. So there was visibility. And then I could get that money back, you know, out of the account. And then they would do the same. And it allowed us, I thought it was a great procedure. It was a great idea. Was that your idea? It was my idea. I yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, you know, it was a lot. I mean, I got to the point where it was really expensive to have the kids over. And, yeah. and at the time we lived on a little lake. And so the kids loved to come over, you know, we had, we were in Minnesota, we had a little hot tub and they'd be out in the cold lake, jump in the hot tub. You know, it was a fun place. And, but I mean, I, I mean, I was getting divorced, you know, and it was expensive. And yeah. I was just like, yeah. okay, something it's got to give here because otherwise my other children are just going to be foregoing dinner and that's not going to go well with CPS when I'd be like, well, I fed those kids. Like, I'm sorry, I didn't feed these others. Oh, yeah. Oh, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing here anyway? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, there, there's there's all kinds of little things like that. But, you know, I didn't ever have children. So heaven knows I'm, I'm not, you know, completely oblivious to how much it costs to have kids around. Um but I certainly don't think of all of the things like how right. much it costs to get new wheels for your skateboard and those right. types of expenses that just come up like crazy, I'm sure. Well, in some one expense that I find people forget about is both the cost of standardized testing when kids do SAT, ACT yeah. and the prep classes, yeah. but then also it's college application fees. When kids are applying to 10, 12, 15 colleges, which my new mind did not, um, 15 colleges times 75 adds up, you know? <laughs> and so what's your recommendation on that? They just, just split it. Pick, pick two, pick, I, two I, pick three? I, well, we are, my kids did less. We had one, I think, who did 10. Um, I think I had one who did seven. And then the others were all like one. They all picked, knew what they wanted and they, you know, applied to that. I mean, I have one this year, the one who's graduating, he applied to one school, didn't have to take the SAT because of COVID and literally got in in like August. So talk about a sweet college process. The rest of the siblings are not pleased with them because they're like, you did what? Yeah, and really. the scholarship, they're like, you did not get the full meal deal here at all. <laughs> Lucky duck. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, but parents need to split those costs. And those are things that we as professionals, when we're working with families, you know, need to think about those things. Yeah. Driver's ed is a Driver's big thing. Exactly. That's the one I would prom. Oh, big time. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And there's so many things like that. But having that's one thing I love about the collaborative process is being able to have those conversations. Whereas in a litigation process, when yeah. I'm putting in some of these things, attorneys will be like, Elise, do we really need to add that? I'm like, yeah, we do. We really it's a real that. expense. I'm yeah. like, gonna happen. I think one of the hardest things about the collaborative process um, is, is trying to mesh the value of the process itself with some of the realities of conversations that you need to have. Totally. So, right, in collaborative, some of you probably don't know this, but what we try to do is allow people to craft their own solution. Yep. And so we try to guide them into, we have these difficult conversations. We try to guide them into creating a solution. Um, but if you're not a money person, you're probably not going to ever get to a solution. And then it's up to the professionals to step a little bit, I think, outside of the bounds of the process and be a little bit more directive. Right. Yeah. I did have to say to these folks yesterday, look, you guys, there's this much money. That's all there is. Right. How are you going to solve for this? What are you going to do? How are you going to make it go? And well, and I do think as professionals, I don't know about you, but I sometimes will have what I call just brainstorming sessions. Sometimes yes. I even call them, you know, where you kind of put all this shit, excuse my French, on the table and yes. let's look at the big yes. pile. And because sometimes I think people don't think outside the box very well, you yeah. know, about solutions. Yeah. And from a financial perspective, I mean, I've had clients where they're like, I have no idea where I'm going to come up with money. And I'm like, well, you know what? You just bargained to keep this great old big house. I was like, have you considered renting rooms out? Exactly. You know? And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, well, we need to think about that because you can bring in some serious cash. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That, you know, yeah, but they and, don't you know, oftentimes, well, well, oftentimes, once you get people going in that brainstorming process, right. 
they know a whole lot more about what they, they know a whole bunch about their finances. They just don't know it. And they also don't know what to throw out there and how to consider it. So it's a little bit of a um, kind of a fishing expedition. It is. In a flash or in a, in a fashion. And then we get to kind of hang on to the information they give us and give it back to them in a different way to think about it. And right. That's really satisfying. It's hard. It's hard. I love those. I love those brainstorming sessions. And I Me love too. thinking about how can you come up with more money where it doesn't feel like you're coming up with more money. Right. You know, like right. it, it, it's not like you went and got a 40 hour a week job necessarily, but I mean, maybe you're bringing in as much money as your 40 hour a week job doing some other things and trying to help people figure out their skill set as well. Yeah. Because yeah. I know some people who are like, well, I haven't worked in a while, but you dig down and you figure out, I mean, they are amazing, like copyright people and right. they could earn some money in a, a more kind of condensed fashion and be able to bridge some of that, you know, without having to go get a 40 hour a week job. Well, and now um, w- with COVID teaching us so much about what can be done without leaving oh, the house. Oh, yeah. I think the opportunities are just huge or endless you just have to find them and sometimes you know i don't know if you've used um, vocational counselors for folks. oh yeah yeah that can be such a wonderful experience for absolutely. people to absolutely go back and think about what they like and and how they could actually uh make money out of it i, I don't like to use the word monetize by the way it drives me nuts so <laughs> No worries. But it is so true. I mean, I think figuring out what their passion is and helping them figure out what their zone of genius is and then figure out how in the world can you turn that into some money into your home. And you almost always, I don't think I've ever met someone who hasn't been able to do that. I mean, it's yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's out there. And Mm -hmm. I mean, we have I've seen some amazing transformations of clients that, yes. you know, weren't working at all. And then, you know, now they're like, well, I'm a contract, you know, EA to the, the president of Microsoft. I'm like, well, of course you are. <laughs> like, you know, you're the most organized human on the planet that we realized the minute you turned in your finances to us, alphabetized, you know, <laughs> by in my right boxes. Yes. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I agree. Yeah. That's the, um, when you can help someone find their own breakthrough, it's, oh. it's truly rewarding. Um, it's the most it's, rewarding thing we do. It is. It absolutely is. It makes it feel like, um, I think everything we do is helpful. I, I think everything we do is to help people, but when there's an epiphany, oh. um, it's, it's amazing. It's so lovely to feel like you were a little bit of a, a part of it, maybe pushed a little bit on this side of it or pushed over here. And oh, I it. love that. Well, and one thing I also love about the divorce process, which is a strange thing to love sometimes, but I love when you work with somebody who's, you know, really been struggling and, you know, maybe there's mental health issues on one side, maybe it's some type of you know, intimate partner violence, and I don't mean violence, physical violence, but you know, some of the the financial control, the different power dynamics. When that person who has been kind of on the receiving end, some of those negative things can feel heard and can feel like, oh, wait a minute, this other person truly gets where I'm coming from. Like, I'm not crazy. I'm not, you know, insane. Like, Right. And watching them build back up their confidence in their own decision making is yeah. absolutely the most powerful thing to me to watch. Yes, yes, yeah. Or at least setting them on that path because sometimes oh, that takes a while. It can take a long while. Yeah. And I mean, I'm kind of notorious for staying in touch with my clients. You know, they'll be like, Elise, you know, seven years later, here I am. You know, my kid just graduated from high school. We just did this. I just got this job. And literally it makes every negative thing that happened in those intervening seven years worthwhile. That's cool. How do you stay in touch with people? Do you reach out to them? I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I do weird things. I do Zoom coffee hours. I go out to lunch with past clients, um, all kinds of things. Yeah. And um, we actually are creating a client advisory board now because I have gotten some of the best insight from past clients. I mean, good and bad, you know, Great and idea. clearly we have 
all kinds of room for improvement. But, um, you know, getting those past clients, and it's been interesting looking for people who are not only ideal clients and those that I've loved working with, but even finding clients who we found more challenging and yes. what could we do better and how can we make a more challenging relationship maybe less challenging and more effective for the client? Yes, I think that's fabulous. I can't wait to hear what you, um, what you learn. Yeah, it's been an interesting process thus far. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, I think it's um, a, great, a great way to get more feedback. I mean, yeah. I don't know, we're, we're a firm that believes in kind of that idea of a growth mindset. Like, you know, we yeah. need to be making improvements all the time yes. because obviously yeah. we're, we're just little old people who are messing up all the time. <laughs> well, and you know, I, I'm not that long in this particular discipline. Uh, but I've been working with people with their money for a really, really long time. <laughs> um, and I also have worked you know, in business. So right. there's a streamlining of thought that occurs in my mind that doesn't always make it into some things that can be process heavy, like divorce. Right. Um, and, and trying to find the balance between those pieces. Because the other thing I'm also really cognizant of is there's no sense spending people's money for stuff that is not, that's just process. So maybe we could do things easier and streamline things, you know, efficiencies of, of operations has always been one of the things that I'm all over. And, Absolutely. And I think um, the hardest part, I think from, from my angle is that everybody who's working in the business is an independent. So there's all these different thoughts on how it should be done. Oh, big time. Uh-huh. And finding a way to bring those together. I, um, I'm actually about to go on a, a mission with four or five other professionals just to talk about the budgeting process. Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. Because there's a lot of varying um, opinions about how important it is at the beginning and then at the middle and then toward the end. And I think they shift. Oh, big so, time. Yeah. Uh, so that I, that's going to be really fun, I think. <laughs> well, I can't wait to hear about that. I think that's yeah. going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've all got stories to tell. Oh, yeah. Big to inform time. It. Yeah. Well, and budgeting is so important. I mean, I just it think is. it's so critical to the family family's whole well-being yeah I mean let's yeah. be serious yes absolutely to the extent though that at some point in time you you stop a little bit in the process and quit refining things down by ten dollars and five dollars <laughs> because that's a lot of money to spend to do that it's like okay you've got it you know what to do with it now <laughs> and, absolutely yeah let's take the professionals well, out so of that tweaking that is so awesome. I really look forward to hearing about that. I think that's an yeah. amazing thing you're doing. And um, I mean, the more and more we can do to help clients and get them where they're with the right person talking about money at the right yeah. price point. I mean, yeah. I am a firm believer and I'm like, send them to Marianne, send them to Marianne. Yeah. I've done a, a thing recently and somebody in my office said, Elise, can we have a meet Marianne? I was like, we could have a meet Marianne. <laughs> So um, I guess I could share this with my team that is referring <laughs> people to you, or we could just bring you on to like a team lunch thing and we could do a meet Marianne. I would love that. And, yeah. and by the way, thank you for all the folks you send my way. It's always oh, fun. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I just think you do great work and I think my clients are in great hands with you. And so we really appreciate everything you do with them. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and I really appreciate you coming on today. My pleasure. And enjoy the rest you. of your day. Yeah, I love seeing you as well. And today's going to be beautiful. So yes. hopefully we can get outside. Get outside. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Thanks. Go have Mary. some oysters. See you okay. later. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.